Welcome to the What You Next podcast. In this podcast, your host, Lori Ami, will interview published authors to chat about their work, journey to getting published, and their book recommendations. If you share a passion for books and are always looking for your next read, then join us. Welcome to the What You Next podcast. Today, we have historical romance author, Amy Rose Bennett. In this interview, we chatted about her latest series, the Dose Rude Will Debbie Jen series, which in book one is a best friend, little sisters. Book two is a marriage convenience. And book three is a beauty in the beast retelling of a marriage convenience. And I have to admit, I absolutely adore this historical romance series. In this interview, we chatted about her writing process, what it's like to write a historical romance, and as well as a brand of book recommendations. Now let's go to the interview. Hi, Amy. Welcome to the Watch Your Next podcast. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for having me. So happy to have you here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I always wonder where to start with this, but um, I'll, I'll start off saying I'm an Australian author of historical romance and I'm very happily married, almost 27 years now. My anniversary is actually next week, so that's kind of exciting. Um, I'm a mum to two adult daughters who are both presently at university. And for many years before I became an author, I was a speech pathologist. Um, so for over 20 years, but, but now I write full time. Um, so I'm loving that. Um, aside from writing, I absolutely love cooking. It's a huge passion of mine. And um, since I've been staying at home so much, I've been baking lots of bread. Mm. So it's all about the bread. I've been making Vienna loaves and um, I was determined to master ciabatta. Um, I tried sourdough, but then my starter was a complete flop. But um, aside from doing that, I also love to travel. But um, I haven't been doing much of that lately. So, yeah, I'm doing a lot more writing. Yeah, well, I tried as a sourdough starter and it was just like a mess. I was like, I don't yeah, know if it's work. Right. It's quite you know. Yeah, I, I sort of got some bubbles, but I think I had the wrong kind of flower. So, um, yeah, I even named it Fred, but Fred's dead. So, so it's on to other bread. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was like, it's too finicky for me. So maybe I'll try something else. I'm waiting to get yeast so I can actually make it. Yeah, a lot of that. patience required. No, I don't. Yeah. yeah, so. All right. So what inspired you to become a writer? Yeah. Well, there's actually no specific event um, that I can think of that inspired my desire to write. Um, you know, forever I've been an avid reader and, um, you know, I think I started reading when I was about four or five and I was always daydreaming up my own stories and jotting them down and, you know, drawing little pictures. And I was still doing that when I was a teenager and I still had some of my notebooks from then with my story ideas. Um, beginnings of stories that were really, really bad. <laughs> and um, the research that I had sort of done from the library back in those days. Um, and English was my favourite subject at school. So I knew it was something that I always wanted to do. But then I ended up studying speech pathology because I didn't think I yeah, was ready to start writing and make a living from it sort of way back then. Um, although it's funny, I do have this really vivid memory of when I decided that I really loved historical romance and that's what I would write. Um, I remember when I was about nine, I um, was home for the school holidays and I watched this um, movie of Jane Eyre and I, I've traced it back to a 1970s movie with George C. Scott and Samantha Egger, but I was absolutely enthralled with it. and. Um, I went to my library and I borrowed the book and I read it from cover to cover. I'm sure I didn't understand half of it, but um, I just knew from that point on that if I was going to be a writer, that I'd write historical romance. That was my fantasy world that I really wanted to live in. Mm. So that's kind of it, really. I love it. Um, so what was your journey to get your first book published? <sighs> well kind of a bit of a long one to get traditionally published um and there are a few bumps along the way and it's a bit of a story again um so i started writing seriously with a view to publication about eight years ago so 2012 mm -hmm. and i'd already started a book a scottish historical romance set during the second jacobite rebellion because i got quite fascinated by that that period um so I'd started that another eight years before that. 
Um, and I had only written three chapters, but I knew I just had to get it done. So in 2012, I said to my husband, I've got to take some time off work. I've just got to write this book. And I kind of need the headspace to do it. And fortunately, we were in the position that I could do that, um, have luxury to take that time off. So I had six months off, no distractions, focused on the book, got it done. And then I thought, well, now what? I've got this book and I have no idea if it's any good or not. So I um, joined Romance Writers Australia and then Romance Writers America and I entered lots and lots of writing contests with that book and I used the feedback to hone my skills. And then I kind of had the writing bug and I wrote a novella, a Regency one mm -hmm. and a Regency romance novel. And then those two Regency books got picked up by two different small presses in 2014. Uh, but sadly, is the way things the way things go, um, both publishers closed within 12 months. But I got the rights back and I got into self-publishing then. So that was 2015. Mm -hmm. But then that Scottish historical romance I'd written, um, it got picked up in 2016 by Harlequin Australia and it came out as an e-book. But um, I guess it's always been my dream to be traditionally published. Um, with one of the big New York publishers. Mm -hmm. And um, I got my big break in 2017. Um, I wrote How to Catch a Wicked Viscount and um, I scored my fabulous agent, Jessica Alvarez, mm -hmm. um, via Pitmad, um, which is a, um, a, a Twitter pitch fest, I think is how they describe it. Mm -hmm. um, so I put my tweets out there she favourited my tweet about um, how to catch a wicked Viscount and um, requested the full manuscript and I'm thrilled to say she loved it. So um, she offered to represent me and then she helped me to get my, um, my book deal with Berkeley. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how it all happened. Fantastic. I love, you know, that it's not a linear process that you know you have some bumps in the roads but you are able to overcome them and try to get your stories being read by different audiences and that the process is not linear it's not just one way to get it done yeah yeah i think everybody's journey is different i mean yeah some people kind of um you know write for years and years before they get to where they want to be and mm -hmm. some people um you know have the luck of writing that not the luck, the, the um, you know, the, the skill to write that book that catches the deal straight away. But um, yeah, it's, it's, if you love it, you just keep going until you get where you want to go. I love it. So how do you organize yourself as a writer? How do you, um, actually, no, let's talk about your writing. How do you, do you follow an outline or do you see where the story leads you? Um, good question. I would say I'm mainly a plotter. Okay. Um, I have to know exactly where I'm going before I start writing a book. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't plan to the nth degree. Um, I like to work out the finer details along the way. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm a cross between a plotter and what we authors sometimes call a pantser. So you kind of pants the plot. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of a, a mixture, so a planter, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but um, I do love it, um, even though I, I do like to put, I love it when I really get to know my characters and get into their heads and then like I've planned out a scene, I think it's gonna go a certain way, but then the characters suddenly take over. I find that really exciting and those moments are super cool. Um, like the sneaky first kiss that you weren't planning on happening in that scene, but then it kind of happens and you just have to go with it. So um, yeah. yeah, that's always kind of fun when that happens. <laughs> um, but for um, my disreputable debutante series with Berkeley, um, I was really careful in my plotting for the series arc because, um, you know, there's four heroines. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to know everything about them. So I worked out really carefully who they're, ideal romantic partners would be and all of the protagonist's goals and their conflicts and their emotional wounds and the, um, the tropes that I wish to explore. Mm -hmm. um, I have used forced proximity um, as a trope in a couple of the books, like um, 
Sophie Brightwell and Nate in How to Catch Wicked Viscount, they have a bargain going on, which mm -hmm. kind of forces them together in um, situations. And um, Arabella and Gabriel from How to Catch and Erin Earl end up in a marriage of convenience, which I don't think I'm spoiling it too much. I think it's kind of evident from the blurb on the back of the book. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, Olivia and Hamish in um, my book coming out in August, How to Catch a Sinful Marquess. That has a beauty in the beast trope and um again they're forced together they're on a road trip to the isle of sky which was mm -hmm. kind of fun to write um yeah so before i write each story I, I draft out the plot not chapter by chapter so much but key scene by key scene until until the end basically so that's that's my process i love it and so how do you organize yourself as a writer how do you keep track of ideas, inspirations, characters, and specifically thinking about writing a series where there are so different characters that are interconnected. How do you keep track of all of that? Yeah, um, yeah, look, I'd like to say I'm super organized. Um, and I just said that I'd planned everything out for this, this series. And I did for each individual book. Um, but in terms of this sort of the interactions of characters from each book sort of coming into like a secondary characters into the main characters book, I, I didn't plan that. Um, I, I didn't plan that to any great degree. It just kind of happened. I guess that was a pantsing part of it. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm semi-organised. Like, I, I do write down a lot of notes in notebooks. Um, creatively, I find I work better if I handwrite things down. Oh, I don't know if you heard that. That was my dog who just sneezed in the background. <laughs> it was a big sneeze. Um, I also, um, you know, I'll sometimes get random ideas when I'm out and about. So I'm always making notes um, in my phone or on my iPad um, or on a, in a notebook in my handbag. Um, you know, sometimes my characters will just start talking to me, so I just have to get the dialogue down. Um, but in terms of planning more carefully, I use a program called Scrivener. Um, some authors write their manuscript in Scrivener, but I tend to use Word. But I use Scrivener for all my planning, so it's where I keep my detailed plot outlines and um, bits and pieces of research. So links to articles I found on the internet, um, it's all in Scrivener. So I'm scribbling like crashes, yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't be good. But um, I also like using Pinterest a bit to create mood boards for each of my books because I like the visual of that. Um, I'm a little bit behind, so if people go and visit my Pinterest boards now, they won't see um, my disreputable debutantes books. I've kind of got them in a secret thing at the moment. But yeah, I've, um, I'm planning on releasing those soon so people can have a look if they'd like to. Um, yeah, so that's basically how I organize myself. Hello. Um, do you share your work along the way? Do you wait to the completed father to read? Um, with my self-published books, um, I do share small snippets every now and again with reader fans, in particular Facebook groups I'm in. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a reader fan group called Amy Rose Bennett's Reader Salon. So those members get to see little snippets from time to time. Um, but I don't use beta readers or belong to critique groups. Um, actually, that's not quite true. I should say my husband is my beta reader. Mm -hmm. He actually loves my books and reads all of them. And he's, he's awesome, actually. If I'm, I'm stuck on a plot point, um, he's a great sounding board and helps me work things out when I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so aside from that, yeah, I don't really share that much. Um, with my traditionally published books, though, um, sort of close to publication time, I, um, I will share um, little snippets that I get the go ahead to, to use as teasers. So in general, I keep, well, with my disreputable debutant books, I've kept everything quite close to my chest until, yeah, close to publication time. So you pretty much have to wait till the book comes out to, to see it, so. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So what is the process like to write a historical romance? What kind of research do you conduct? How do you come about, you know, writing a, a certain time period and just a story within there? Um, yeah, so in terms of um, 
the process and what kind of research I do. Um, I find the process is different for each book. And the research I do is dictated by the plot I've developed and, and the characters' backgrounds. Um, so it varies. Um, I've, I've been a reader of historical romance for, for forever, it feels like. And um, I've always loved history. I studied it at school. So I feel like I've absorbed a lot about the periods I write in by osmosis, for want of a better way of putting it. Um, but of course, I don't know everything. And I think one of the biggest challenges for a, a, a writer of historical romance, unless you have a degree in history in that time period, is that sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. And I think that's when people tend to kind of get things a bit wrong. Um, so to counteract that, you really do need to read widely about the time period you've, you've chosen to write in. Yeah. You need to write. Um, from your word and phrase choice, um, like I've always got my nose in the dictionary. Um, I really use the online etymology dictionary a lot. Um, which I don't mind doing. I'm a bit of a word nerd. Um, as part of my speech pathology degree, I studied linguistics mm -hmm. subject. So, um, yeah, I don't mind doing that. Um, but, yeah, you have to, to sort of make sure that you've got the little details right too, like were there door handles or doorknobs on a door or um, the type of soap somebody used or um, how long did it take to get from point A to point B with a horse and carriage and what type of horse and carriage. So um, you have to really kind of question all the little details just as much as researching the bigger picture stuff like the, the social um, laws and etiquette of the time and the politics and the marriage law and inheritance law and, you know, titles of the peerage and all of that stuff. So, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot, quite a lot that's involved. Um, but, yeah, as I said, I like history. So for me, it's not a chore at all. Um, I do online research a good deal of the time and um, I find um, a lot of historical romance authors are very generous with their knowledge. So I'm in a few groups where if you're a bit stuck, you can ask a question, say on, in a Facebook group, a private Facebook group, and someone will know something about it and point you in the right direction. Um, a lot of authors have wonderful blogs about particular topics and they've got the the primary sources they've used listed at the bottom. So you can check those out. Um, what else do I do? Sometimes I find um, random kind of PDF, kind of academic articles on particular topics that I need to look into. So um, in How to Catch an Errant Earl, and I talk about this more, I think a bit um, later on, but um, Arabella has an interest in um, medicine. So I found, some really neat academic articles about 19th century medicine, which helped. Um, and yeah, sometimes it's just digging around, you find some really interesting primary sources, like um, again with How to Catch an Errant Earl, um, Arabella and Gabriel, hero and heroine, are in, um, are in Switzerland. And um, I found on Project Gutenberg, actually, you can probably get it just about anywhere these days because it's public domain, but Mary Shelley um, had gone on a six weeks tour of the continent. So um, I got her book and kind of read through it and found out all this neat information about um, Switzerland and the places my characters go to. So um, yeah, lots of different places and lots of different things to keep me busy. I'm always going down research rabbit holes. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I feel like that's, it's fascinating. I love historical romance because it just takes you to a different, different story, a different place. And what I find it fascinating is that you learn something from it and you start to think about it. It's like what we take for granted, they didn't have it, what we assume that it should be no, universal knowledge is not really a historic universal knowledge at the time. And so I'm always fascinated to know, like, how do you come about? You know, thinking about even the words that you write, they're, they may not be historically accurate. So looking at, you know, looking at the process of making sure that they are somewhat, you know, as best as you can. It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly is. So now let's talk about this for disreputable Debbie Chan's What's the source of inspiration? Um, look, 
it's funny, I had quite a lot of different ideas rattling around in my head for a bit before it all kind of gelled together. I um, had one particular scene in my head, um, which is in How to Catch a Wicked Viscount. And um, without spoiling too much, there, there's a bedroom scene with Sophie and Nate, which kind of has an amusing ending because Nate has had a bit too much to drink. So that was one of the first kind of scenes that I got in my head. And that's, that's in book one. But in terms of the whole series um, premise or the hook for it, um, that started as a separate idea, but then it joined up with Sophie and Nate's story. So the whole premise for the series, um, yeah, I basically had this scene in my head where there are four female friends attending an exclusive ladies academy and they're about to embark on their first season and they decide that to have an advantage over the other women they'll be competing with to get husbands um, when they enter the marriage bar is to, to really try and understand the male mind. So, so one of the, the debutantes, actually, she's a bit of a firebrand, her name's Charlie. Um, she decides to introduce her friends to things like drinking brandy and smoking and looking at naughty books and pictures. And um, yeah, I just thought that was a whole kind of fun idea. It seems like a modern idea, but I thought, well, you know, I think women across the ages have always been curious about these things. Why does it just have to be a male domain? Of course, there are reasons why back then, um, but I just thought, yeah, that would be like a fun idea to ex explore. But, but of course, something goes wrong and they get sprung and then they get thrown out and there's a huge scandal. So, so they have the party and then the whole um, sort of series goes on from there. Now that you're a socially disgraced young woman and you're not going to get invited anywhere, you're never going to get an Max voucher. So how are you going to get a husband if that's what you really want? So, um, yeah, each heroine then, you know, um, sort of goes on to, to find a husband in a different way. But, um, yeah, that was kind of the thing that started it all, was that kind of scene in my head. Yeah, I love it. I love the fact that you turn, you know, scandal, a place that it can be considered one woman and to turn it upside down and say she can still find a husband and a rake <laughs> you know even yeah. that, you know yeah. even more than that you, you can find you can we can reform a rake <laughs> you know that is possible yeah. and here's different ways yeah. why yeah and so their reasoning was these these young women is well our reputations are in the mud now so which men will look at us, or maybe other men who don't have such great reputation, who are the, the bad boys at the time, the rake hills. So, um, yeah. So, um, and I was going to mention, actually, along yeah. the lines, I, I, I was, um, you know, um, when I came up with this idea and I thought, well, maybe it sounds a bit modern. Um, I mentioned sort of at the beginning that I've had the opportunity to travel. Um, well, I do like to travel. Um, my husband's actually got a job with the airline. So yeah, that's why I've kind of been able to travel a bit. But um, last year we went to um, Budapest and we went to an art gallery in Buda Castle. And I saw this painting and um, it was called Girls After the Ball and it's from 1850. And it depicts some young women. Um, they're in 18th century dress and they're checking out these risque paintings and drawings like etchings and I thought that's exactly what I had in mind for my book so I thought that was kind of cool that some other artists had the same kind of scene in their head so um yeah that was a bit of history that I thought was interesting I love it I love like you know that it is possible it is not that far-fetched that there's a curiosity about exploring what it would be to be you know what do we like to drink or to smoke or to read memoirs or sexual nature, you know, and just to have yeah. the friendships to yeah. a safe space to, to explore it, even though, you know, within a yeah. friendship to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about marriage because so much of the series is about marriage and finding and being in the marriage mark, you know, with the warm reputation. What was it important to showcase the various ways for the girls to get married, like marriage and convenience, um, first proximity, beauty and the beast, all those different tropes, but also what was, what was it like, you know, to get married at this time period? Um, this is a really good question. It really got me thinking about um, 
yeah, this question really got me thinking um, because, yeah, my whole series is about marriage. Um, and my, essentially my heroines are out to catch husbands. I mean, it's in the titles. Um, but that being said, I, I also think my heroines are quite strong women, um, despite the fact that their odds are stacked against them and their reputations are in the mud. Um, I think they still do have agency. So whatever situation they're in, they do try to take control and they make plans and they make things happen. They make things happen and they eventually do get what they want, which is the happily ever after with the man of their dreams. Um, and a man that also recognises what their dreams are beyond marriage. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a really good question. And I guess from a historic, historical perspective, um, and in terms of the marriage-based theme, um, I guess getting married was the main goal for many women back then in the Regency era. And of course, for their families as well, because you know, if you hailed from the middle classes and the upper classes, marriage was an opportunity for you to improve your wealth and your status. Um, and while people have always fallen in love, um, up until the Regency era in particular, I think marriage was often transactional in nature, mm. especially in the upper classes. You know, it was all about networking and um, shoring up your power base. And um, if you were middle class or landed gentry, um, I think you kind of aspired to, you know, at least attain financial security, if not to climb in even further up the social ladder. And I think, um, you know, looking back at books I love to read, like books by Jane Austen and later Charlotte Bronte, um, they certainly showcased the groundbreaking idea of marriage for love and even crossing class barriers to do so. Um, and I really think Elizabeth Bennett, um, I love her as a heroine. She's kind of the it girl for me for Regency romance. Um, you know, she holds out for true love. Darcy's um, 10,000 pounds a year isn't mm -hmm. enough at first. She, you know, she wants to know his feelings are sincere before she does say yes to his proposal. So I think that's kind of really neat. That, um, that those authors were writing that back then. And um, going back to your original question, I actually didn't set out to kind of showcase the different types of marriage that were available at the time, but um, I mean, I did. So I guess the need to do that just kind of evolved with each book's plot, yeah. my character's yeah. circumstances and the trope that fitted within that. Um, that being said, um, each of my heroine's pathways to marriage is a little different um, in each book. And especially for Arabella in How to Catch Mare and Earl. Um, she's my blue stocking Scots heroine. She doesn't really want marriage at first, unlike the other girls. Um, she kind of deep down thinks that marriage isn't quite for her. And she's decided she wants to um, sort of do good in the world. She has quite a practical nature. Um, Mm -hmm. And if she could have, she would have become a doctor, but um, her family's quite against it. They wanted to give up all that, that blue stocking nonsense and, and get married for the family. Um, but at the beginning of the book, or close to the beginning, she meets um, Gabriel Lord Langdale, the errant Earl in question, and she kind of has to get married, so it kind of throws her vision off course. Um, so, yeah, in that I've used, like, the compromised heroine forced engagement, whole marriage of convenience trope um, quite early on. And in the Arabella story, after she's married, the focus of the, the story becomes, you know, how do you get your husband that you hardly know anything about to fall in love with you? Because maybe you don't just want a marriage of convenience after all. So, um, yeah, I um, explored different kinds of, I guess, marriage tropes in the other books as well. But if I talk about them, um, in too much detail, I might give too much of the plot away. So, um, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But basically, despite the reputations, sorry, 
Yeah, you did. I think I love it. And then I think on the how to catch a sin for Marquis, Mar Marquis or Marquess, and we see Gretna Green, which is where couples go to love, which I love. Like it's one of those things where when you think about it, there's different ways to that you showcase um, marriage. And I think in that in the third book, you mentioned you go over the history. You say. Like, this is, you know, if we, where should we get married? And it's like, we can't get married in London because we only need to do the bands. If we can't get married here, we, we can get married here right now, right this way, because it's okay. It's one of the few places where it's available. So I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in, in the third book, you have a child in the story. How hard was it to write for our end? Tilda, um, I I loved writing her into the story. I um I haven't written many children into my books before, but um yeah, I, I loved writing her. And I, I don't think I had much trouble at all. Um, I worked in paediatrics um, as a speech pathologist for many many years, so I feel like I know young children quite well. And, and you know, I've had two girls of my own, so um. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed writing her into the story and, and I loved writing the scenes with her and, and Hamish, my big kind of battle scarred um, Highlander. And um, there's one particular scene, I, I won't describe it, but um, oh yeah, I, he's, he's quite a softy at heart. And I think their interactions, um, oh, I hope they come across as quite sweet because I, I, I really had such fun with those. Yeah, I really love to know that, like, she just added a new flavor to the story. Like, I think you brought in this maternal feeling for Olivia, and then brought this softy side for Hamish, or Hamish, and, and then the whole process of uncovering her backstory was just fascinating. Like, you know, how Tilda find her voice and led them to their yeah. wow. That was a beautiful process. Yes, and I yeah, I'm. I'm glad. I'm glad you noticed that because, um, yeah, I, I sort of um, when I answered you before, I didn't really talk about that. But yes, I think um, perhaps knowing children and how they communicate when they're younger and um, some of the difficulties they might face getting their ideas across, um, especially when they're, um, you know, in this strange situation and emotionally upset and how that impact that it would have on the child. And, you know, there's a process involved um, for her to open up. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, I, I really enjoyed writing those scenes. Um, it was a little bit different for me, but um, yeah, it was, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Awesome. So what are some of your upcoming projects? A few on the go. So at the moment I'm writing How to Catch a Devilish Duke. That's um, the fourth book in the series, um, and it's Charlie, um, her story. She was kind of the instigator of the dorm party at the beginning of book one, and she's a really strong character in my mind, and I'm having such a hoot writing her story. Um, and then the hero is a duke, and this is actually my first duke hero I've ever written. So um, his name is um, Maximilian Devereux, the Duke of Exfor. Mm -hmm. So um, that's fun too, writing a duke hero because Dukes were so powerful back then. So um, yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, there's no news on when that's coming out just yet, but it will come out. Um, aside from that, I'm also working on a three book proposal um, with my agent for a new series. So hopefully I'll have some news about that in the not too distant future. And in um, August, How to Catch a Sinful Marquess is coming out. That's Olivia and Hamish's story. And then in November, um, I've got a self-published Regency romance in one of my existing series that's coming out. So, um, yeah, I'm certainly busy. I love it. <laughs> now, let's go to a round of book recommendations. This is an opportunity for you to share with the audience what they should read next. What is your favourite genre? Um, it, I would have to say historical romance. Um, but aside from that, um, I also do enjoy reading... Um, Oh, the term is grip lit. Um, so psychological suspense thrillers, um, like Girl on the Train, that sort of mm -hmm. kind of book. Um, yeah, so they're kind of my go-to genres. I love it. Who's your favorite author? Oh, 
it's so hard to pick just one. At the moment, I would say it's Tessa Dare. I only recently, I've heard about Tessa Dare for years, but it was only last year that I read one of her books. Mm-hmm. And then I just kind of binge read a whole bunch. So she's kind of my favourite um, at the moment. But aside from that, if I could mention two more, I love Kerrigan Burns books and also um, Regency Romances by Anna Campbell, the Australian author. I adore those too. But um, in terms of Griplet books, um, my favourite author in that genre is um, Nikki French, which is a pseudonym for a husband and wife writing team. Um, I've, I think I've read everything that they've ever written. As soon as it comes out, it's on my Kindle. So, yeah. I love it. What has been a book you read this past year that you love? Um, I'm going to have to say the book that I couldn't put down was um, Bringing Down the Duke by Evie Dunmore. Mm-hmm. Um, I just loved it. Um, and I can't wait to read the next one, which is coming out, I think, in September. Yep. Um, a road for one's own, of one's own. So, yeah. Awesome. Tell us where you can find you online. Okay, well, I'm pretty much everywhere except Instagram. So on Facebook, I have an author page and I also have a regular page. So you can send me a friend request if you like. Um, I'm also in a couple of Facebook groups. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my um, reader salon, Amy Rose Bennett's reader salon, and I'm in another group called The Drawing Room. And another one, if you like spicy reads, um, there's a few historical romance authors we've kind of joined together and we've got a group called Historical Harlots. So they're all on Facebook. And aside from that, I'm on Twitter, I'm on BookBub, Pinterest. Um, and then of course I've got my, my website. So you can um, find me at amyrosebennett.com and I've got a newsletter sign up there. So yeah, if you want regular updates on all my writing, there's a link there to sign up for that. Love it. Thank you, Amy, for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to share with friends, subscribe, or rate and review the show. This is the easiest way to support this podcast. Want to join a romance-loving community? Want weekly book recommendations, monthly author Q&As, and book recommendation meetups? Make new friends? Then join our Patreon community. To sign up, please follow the links in the show notes. What to Read Next Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts to love on frolic.media slash podcast. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.